Hi, everyone. Again, um, Marianne LaMonica from the AMC. So I'm here to welcome our lead sponsor, Sotheby's, um, who are presenting a panel called Understanding NFTs and the Opportunity for Museums. And so just out of curiosity, can I see a show of hands of folks who actually understand NFTs? All right, well, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> because I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, I've been doing my due diligence and I've listened to many conversations, but it's the kind of thing I think it takes a little effort and time to really understand. And I love that we're focusing on how NFTs can be opportunities for um, museums and for curators um, and for artists. So um, please um, welcome our panel today. Thank you. Good afternoon, we're so thrilled to be here. My name is Christy Coombs. I'm Senior Vice President at Sotheby's Advisory. I know many of you, I can see some friends behind those masks out there. So thank you for joining us today. And I may ask the other uh, panelists just quickly to give their names and then we'll dive into the questions. Is this, yeah. Hi everyone, thank you. Um, for having us. Thank you, Sotheby's and AAMC. I am uh, Charlotte Eitan. I'm the director of the Particle Collection. Is this on? Hi, I'm Nina Del Rio. And I know some of you, not all, I um, run Sotheby's Advisory, which really just means I have the pleasure of working with museums, large public entities, cultural institutions, um, in the work that we do at Sotheby's, which we've had, we have done for many years. Um, and here with, with many of my colleagues today, I'm really happy to see everybody. And uh, hi, my name is Jose Rosero, and I'm working with the platform uh, called Doing Good, where we're combining uh, NFT art sales with social impact. Thank you all so much. So let's get into this. What is an NFT? <laughs> Nina, can you give us an overview? <laughs> I hardly. Um, we, I absolutely will. I, I sort of want to frame this conversation, though, a little bit so that we can excite. I have a feeling, and I haven't spent any time with either one of these panelists, so this will be really interesting, but I have a feeling that there will be a few themes that will bubble up. So why are we talking about NFTs at the AAMC conference? Well, in fact, I mean, Sotheby's has only been selling NFTs for a little over a year. And I would say about six months ago, maybe eight months ago, the director of the AAMD came to me and said, can you just talk to a few museum directors about NFTs? And I said, I, I'm not a technologist, I know nothing. And what our CEO, myself, and one of our, our um, council just got on a Zoom call, which we thought was gonna be a few people and it ended up being 60 museum directors. And we really got into it with NFTs. And it, and it started our thinking about how can we be working with museums and help museums to answer this question of what to do with NFTs and where do we fit in? So I want you to think about the, the name of this panel. It really is a question. We are trying to understand with all of the, the organizations we work with, with all of these museums, how can we create opportunities for museums? And so we get two very basic questions from many museums. One is, should we be collecting NFTs? And the second is, how can we be creating a revenue opportunity for our institution using an NFT and, and really using works from the collection without actually divesting or deaccessioning those works? So those are two pretty big questions that we don't have the answer to, just wanna say that out loud, but we talk a lot with museums and with your colleagues about, about how to make this um, productive and how to make this, how to make the right decisions, whatever that means. So there are some other themes that run through the work that we do at Sotheby's and what is an NFT, a non-fungible token? The, the fact that this is a non-changeable, it's not a dollar which you can exchange for something else. It's actually a thing that you cannot change. So why is that important? And again, I'm, I'm, I'm not a technologist, so please don't ask me to get technical in any way, but I will tell you about what I think are the sort of overarching, really important themes. Think of, of when you 
buy a home and there's title to your home or your car, how much infrastructure goes around is put in place to make sure that that title is in a place that's secure, to make sure that title is what it is, because all it says is that you own the thing that you do. There's title insurance, there are title brokers, there's a fee for that title. Well, in fact, imagine an NFT replacing your title. That NFT lives on the blockchain. You always will know where it is. You are the only person who can access it. It cannot be changed. That title, all those, all those people who are intermediaries to help you keep that title secure, all of that goes away. So think of that as like a really dumbed down example of what the potential could be for NFTs. So, and I don't want to go too far into this, but when you start thinking about an NFT as a unique object, either an, uh, an artwork itself or as an identifier for an artwork, think of authorship, think of provenance, think of what artists could do even in having an NFT associated with a sculpture or a painting and all of the information about that work of art lives on the NFT. So I just wanna plant these little seeds in this discussion because I have a feeling that the person to my left and to my right knows a whole lot more about this than I do, but we think about disintermediation. We think about creating revenue for institutions and then we'll talk about smart contracts a little later and why they're important. Thank you, Nina. Do you have anything to add to that, Charlotte? No, I guess um, to add to what you said, um, for me, the way that, because I, I come from a traditional art world background. So for me to understand NFTs and get involved in the NFT space, it was very much about understanding it in the simplest of ways. And the way that I understood it is very much NFTs can be anything. Uh, not just artworks, but it's if you, I usually use the example of a t-shirt. So, you know, if you buy a t-shirt, you have to prove, you, you have the proof of the receipt saying that this is the t-shirt that I got. But NFTs exist on a blockchain, which Nina said about, um, you know, and, and, and the thing about that is that it's, it's on a public ledger. So everything is traced. The provenance trail is there and it exists every time it is traded. So that's the proof without, it, it's, it's automatic proof. So if you forget your, your, your receipt, then you can't prove that that t-shirt is yours. But on the blockchain, you will know that that's the artist, that's the curator. Um, you will know that it's been traded and it went from this person to this person to this person. And there's no, it's, it's, it's facts, the facts are there. So that's how I understood it uh, initially. Thank you, Charlotte. I think that leads into this next slide and thinking about why the blockchain matters. And Jose, you had given some examples too of how you're, you're speaking to people about the technology and the benefits of blockchain. We've touched on some of those anecdotes already today, but are there additional uh, sort of ways in which you're thinking about this and how you further explain the benefit and the opportunity that all of us can be considering? Uh, yeah, I, I like to even simplify things and, and just think about the artist's signature. So, you know, you can think about artworks that you have to spend a lot of time proving that they're legitimate. In this case, you can always trace it back to the artist. And, and there's a lot of power there, you know, as, as a creator, um, not having to go through third parties to kind of um, prove these things. You can even have sovereign smart contracts rather than using a shared one on a, on a platform somewhere. Um, and, uh, you know, all, all of that kind of is encapsulated in this idea that uh, the individual can kind of retain ownership over their intellectual property, their, their, they can get you know, royalties in perpetuity. Um, and these are some new models that, that I feel like haven't really been explored in the traditional art world um, and are being embraced by this new wave of creators and collectors and all, all types of uh, players in, in the market. Thank you. May I just add to that? Because I think that was so well said. Um, giving the creator, the artist, the independence to be their own, and it's really the power both to be their own broker, but also to have something that, that says, I uniquely made this. Yeah. And because there's so much digital community building around NFTs, 
what has happened in the NFT art world is that so many creators are able to show their art and to not necessarily have to have an agent, a gallerist. So we live in and among the, among the gallery world and the auction world and respect everything that happens in that world. But again, this disintermediation, the, the, the artist no longer necessarily needing that agent, both to own their work, to promote their work, to, to sell their work. The existence of a smart contract, which essentially says, here's how that transaction, every time this work of art is sold, the transaction has to take place in this specific way because this transaction lives on the blockchain. And someone else can explain what that is, but I can do a somewhat decent job of it. What, what happens is you start to reintroduce this idea and it is it has existed out there, but it's, it's by and large been squashed by a lot of different states. In fact, the, the, the Artist Resale Rights Act, probably saying that wrong, but the, but the fact that a royalty, every time a work is sold and resold and resold, a portion of that resale would go back to the artist, to the creator, which is really important and which is really meaningful and which, is, which could be a huge pivot. Think about that in the art world. Put that, overlay that on another situation where if a museum sold a work of art, created an NFT from a work from, from the collection and a portion of those proceeds were then given back to the museum, that this whole philanthropic vein could also exist in perpetuity. Start turning that on its head a little bit and say, well, it doesn't have to be an actual NFT. It doesn't have to be a digital work of art. What if when museums deaccessioned, the transaction lived on the blockchain? And every time that Picasso that was deaccessioned by the Met or by whatever museum, every time it was resold, a portion of that sale would then go back to the institution. That's when we start saying, oh gosh, we have no idea what is happening with NFTs, but this isn't going away. There is something here, there's a there there that really has the potential to change philanthropy, I think, and also artist resale work, you know, a part of these proceeds going back to the creator. So Nina, you're talking about two different topics, right? The benefits of blockchain technology and how we can be utilizing that, and then crypto art as NFT, right? So we're thinking about these two different topics. And I think it's important to make sure that there are considerations on both sides. And I hope that we can continue to delve into that. So just jumping back quickly, and I think this is a nice, um, a nice transition. We're just scratching the surface on this technology. I think all of us here, I love being the moderator of these discussions because I have so many questions. So bear with me and thank you all for, for participating. How would each of you see the evolution of NFTs unfolding? I mean, I think you've just given some opportunities and case studies, but are there other considerations on the technology front? Are there other things happening on the digital artist front that we should all be thinking about? It seems like we knew nothing about NFTs, at least I didn't a year ago, and now it's just constantly changing. Um, I would say if you look back at when the internet started, I remember when I wanted to buy something online, it was a whole thing. It wasn't so sophisticated yet. People were scared of frauds. You would buy something online, you wouldn't actually receive it. Um, I think that the evolution with NFTs will be that. Uh, people really learning to understand the space because no one really understands it yet. Everyone's sort of trying to find ways of understanding it through conversations, through trial and error. So I think that um, especially, you know, trying to trying to even buy, buy an NFT, it's a whole thing. You have to buy the blockchain first, and then you have to transfer it to your MetaMask, which, you know, I don't know if you know what a MetaMask is, but essentially it's a wallet where, where you have all your, where you where you have all your NFTs, so you can prove, okay, I have this NFT and this NFT, and you can show that through your wallet. So I think that, you know, the whole process of buying NFT is already so complicated for so many people, and I see that evolving, um, hopefully, and it, it, you know, with Amazon now, you know, you, you don't think twice, you just, you buy it and you know that it's going to be there, you know, the next day or um, <laughs> whereas um, with NFTs, it's like, how do, where do I even start? So I, I think that with the evolution and, uh, you know, once the space becomes more sophisticated, we will see 
um, a much easier way of accessing NFTs and not just for people who are, you know, well versed in the crypto space, but anyone who wants to buy an NFT will be able to do so. Um, so that's one aspect of how I see it evolving. Um, I'll, I'll leave it to you guys. To uh, uh, so for me, um, well, first, I just wanted to say as far as the artists, uh, so the resale royalties, you can actually thank artists for that. That was Dada Art that really pushed for that to become a standard in the space. Um, I was part of a group called Clean NFTs, and we kind of helped push the conversation around the environmental impact into the mainstream. That again was just a small group of concerned artists. And now, you know, anytime there's a project that comes out, they, you know, they have to mention something about what they're going to do, uh, whether they're going to launch on a uh, proof of stake, which is, you know, more um, energy efficient chain, or whether they're going to do carbon offsets or carbon removal. And so, like, I think, and then, and then when we talk about philanthropy, I think that's the next level of this. If you can prove, a model and prove that there's demand and, and keep sort of challenging the, the key players, the platforms, the, um, the you know, uh, companies that are coming in here to um, you're basically incentivizing good actors and incentivizing people to um, push this forward in a way that, that uh, is actually making some kind of change. Um, I think it's possible. I th I've seen this ripple out so many different ways um, if you look at decentralized finance, uh, that wasn't really a thing until one project came out and proved it. And now if you have a blockchain, you know, people won't really invest into it unless they see that there's a healthy decentralized finance DeFi ecosystem on your blockchain. Um, and again, th these things kind of evolve um, because of the nature of these uh, projects because most of it's open source. So if you can take this, this ethos and push that forward, I think you can really start to see um, a change in why people are getting involved and, and the outcomes of these type of technologies. Um, I know there are a couple things I know and a couple things that I hope for. So NFTs, I think we're all sort of um, kind of bubbling around and trying to understand, well, well, how do we navigate what is a really interesting work of art an, an, an NFT expression, a digital work of art, and what's not, and what's the difference between the traditional art world and NFT world, which I'm just going to leave to all of you. Um, you all are smarter than, 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 than we are, and you're museum curators, and we want to be in this conversation. I think what, what, what we know, and what is really important both within the commercial art business, but also in the nonprofit world, in the art world, among museums, is this is opening the door for lots more participation. And there is an openness and a democratization, both, uh, you know, with with in the finance world, um, what blockchain technology has allowed to happen has opened up, which is essentially transparency. How is the transaction being done? Full transparency. And think of the art market, by the way, just the the trans the transactions in the art market, which by nature are incredibly opaque. So the potential for a transparent transaction brings in many more players because there is this distant intermediation because creators can get their art out there. And there is somehow sometimes a more visually accessible aspect to the NFTs that we're seeing out there in the marketplace. There is an openness that is happening. We didn't create it. We all of a sudden were the beneficiaries of it, but more than three quarters of the buyers in any of our NFT sales are new to Sotheby's. So that's huge. That is absolutely huge. There's no other part of the art market where three quarters of the buyers are new. And we're not talking small sales all the time. Some of these sales are ginormous. And again, we didn't predict them and they weren't always with us, but here we are watching this market go nuts. So what we know is that there are many more participants. What I hope and what I, where I think that there's opportunity is there is a, a sort of, I mean, I, I think we overuse this democratization, and I'm probably oversimplifying it, but there is an access, which I think can, can be out there and can be used for the benefit of museums, opening the museums up to perhaps some different audiences and audiences that are by and large really um, interacting with the institution in a digital way, as opposed to in a physical way, you know, and start to think about the community building 
that happens. And, and Charlotte very aptly brought up like, the, you know, the, the beginning of the internet and the communities that existed there and now our Amazon transaction. I'm 100% with, with Charlotte. This will become easier. But the communities that by nature are building up around all of these really wonderful, beautiful visual artists, those could also be communities around institutions. And that's one of the conversations that we have again and again and again with different museums. So that's my hope. I think I think it's it's heading in that direction. I think so. I I I love how you put that. I think that NFTs are a lot about communities and the power of these communities that speak to each other and that, you know, so tapping into that audience as a as a museum, I think is hugely beneficial because you'll see a lot of the under 30s coming in, getting in, interested in art. I don't know if there's a way of, you know, introducing some sort of patrons program through NFTs where you see a wider engagement of audiences. But um, those are all things to explore, but definitely not to ignore because there's a huge potential there with um, a, a, lot of, a lot of people coming together and speaking to each other. And, um, and I think there's, there's pa it's powerful because of that, right? So yeah, on, on the topic of um, accountability and, and community, um, here on the slide, you'll see the Board Ape Yacht Club. And uh, you know, one of the most infamous projects, probably the, the face of NFTs for most people. Um, they, the project uh, behind this actually just uh, did a, a sale for, a, I think it was like uh, deeds to virtual plots of land. This happened yesterday, and um, you know they raised several millions of dollars, and and actually kind of caused so much congestion on the Ethereum blockchain that it made it harder for other people to transact on whatever else they were doing. Um, but that being said, there's a large portion of the um, community, people who hold board apes, people who don't hold board apes, people who tried to buy in last night, who are trying to hold the uh, Yuga Labs, the, the folks who kind of like were building all of this accountable. You know, like this, if, if you are in this kind of open model, um, now you have this ability to kind of really um, speak to, you know, like r rally together and speak to the people who are building and say, hey, like we wanna vote someone out. We wanna vote for better practices. You can't really say that about a Facebook or a Google or something like that, you know, that you, there, you don't really have any say in those kind of uh, platforms. So thinking about the dichotomy of what we're talking about, right? So that NFT as art, NFT as blockchain technology, thinking now too about the different types of crypto art and Bored Apes is a good example, thinking about a collectible versus a unique object. And I, I bring that up only on this slide and at this point only to then think about the credibility of, and authenticity of how a museum would engage in this space, not only accessing that community, but also being mindful of broader sort of collection, mission, institution goals. Are there recommendations or sort of thoughts you have on how museums could be? And of course, we'll want to open this up to the audience here that the curators will probably have the answer to this question, but um, suggestions or, or things to consider for how to do this. I mean, how do you get started? How do you do it in an authentic way? We saw, of course, the Uffizi selling an NFT. Um, is that six, nine months ago now? But I, it sounds like there are many more ways in which you could be leveraging this opportunity and thoroughly engaging the existing audience as well as drawing parallels with your traditional museum audience. So there are a couple of different questions embedded in both that statement and question, but I'd love to hear your thoughts as we're thinking about who we're speaking to in this audience today. So one of the questions that we, we help museums think about, and I, again, you'll notice I'm saying it, we don't have the answer to this, but, but we're, the, the conversation is evolving. And that is, if you are interested in creating an F NFT from a work in the museum collection as a way to create a revenue stream, again, without deaccessioning that work, what should the NFT be? And the, the, the reference that, that Christy is making is to, of course, the NFTs that the Uffizi made which were essentially high resolution reproductions of paintings in the collection, incredibly iconic paintings that many people would not have the opportunity to, to see. They're not traveling to Florence. The lines are really long again. And 
And so what's the value of a reproduction? And essentially what's the difference between the NFT reproduction, I shouldn't call it an, and the NFT of the work of art and the coffee mug that you're selling in the Uffizi gift shop, right? So, so not a lot. And how do you make that interesting? I sound like I'm being incredibly disparaging. I only mean, how do we get away from essentially a very high resolution reproduction of a work of art? And, and what are some ways to bring, to almost make the museum a creator? And this is, this is the direction that we've gone in with many museums, maybe by introducing a living artist into the conversation, into what the NFT could be, maybe a, a type of interpretation so that you're actually engaging an artist who would be working in this vein or have content surrounding them. And again, we don't know the answer, but, but other, other directions are create content around the work of art, create a more interactive way to, to um, sort of live with this work of art. So all of these different creative elements that you could bring into what is the NFT and why is it interesting, which we believe at the end of the day will then draw more eyes and more buyers to the NFT and create a philanthropic vein for the museum. Yeah, building on what you said, uh, Nina, the um, the aspect of, of transparency, but also speaking with your consumer directly. So I think that um, museums can benefit with speaking with their audience and their new members directly, specifically in the NFT space. Um, in a way that they don't feel like they're just consuming something that you're just giving to them, but they're a part of that um, consummation, if that's a. So, so I think that, you know, um, I don't know the answer of how this can be done, whether it's revenues uh, through, you know, like how the Uffizi did it, but, um, but there are ways of of doing this just through conversations and, 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 and seeing, you know, tapping into that, but definitely getting them engaged um, and speaking to them directly uh, would, would be beneficial because they're going to be more on board if they feel like they're a part of it. I love this question uh, because, um, you know, as you were saying, you, you can do something that's more akin to a reproduction or a coffee mug at a gift shop. Um, but I, I would challenge uh, museums to consider creating their own IP, maybe in collaboration with artists or even with the, the audience themselves. Um, there, there's a case to be made uh, in the crypto art world, even with collectibles projects for um, uh, Creative Commons Zero projects. And the idea here is that if it's, if the license is completely open, um, you're you're letting the you're letting anyone who wants to to add value to that, and and at that point you don't really know like you, you don't have full control over it, but also the potential for that to become something bigger than it is, uh, bigger than it, it could be if you were just kind of you know restricting that from growing is massive. Uh, Beeple. Before NFTs, years ago, you know, I was an artist who was doing video projection, and I was lucky enough to have his body of work that he was putting out for free completely. You could, you could, you know, put it in a commercial if you wanted to. I was lucky enough to have his video clips to use to practice um, as I was, you know, starting out in that medium. Because of his, you know, consistent uh, body of work, a piece every day, um, that sort of story. Uh, I think led to his success in this space, because if you're looking for um, to invest in, in someone who's going to be in there for the long term, you know, look no further, right? And so I think for museums or other institutions, uh, if they embrace the creative and collaborative aspect of this space, I think that's really going to be, um, it's going to make you stand out from other institutions that might be just doing the, 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 uh, high res print or something like that. A hundred percent. That's, I mean, not that, not that anyone really knows, but that does seem to be the, the tenor of the conversation with a number of museums as they think about how to bring something interesting, real content, real sort of artist um, involvement, really creating something new. It's, it's, it's probably easier. I made it sound easier than it is, you know, than it would be in execution, but 
Um, it, those are the, the types of projects that I see that seem to hold their value in the space among collectors. And um, yeah. Yeah, getting the space interested in what the museum is doing with direct engagement with the community. I think a lot of people coming into museums or getting into the art world, they don't even know where to start, um, especially if you have no idea where to go. Uh, you don't know, you have no knowledge in the art world. How do you how do you get in? And I think if museums speak to that space, uh, they will tell you themselves how you can utilize it, you know, because you can speak to them directly on these channels like Discord. They can directly answer you and tell you, and they're really, they really love to talk on those channels. So you'll see all types of feedback. And I think that might also give museums ideas on how to leverage NFTs for funding purposes or, or whatever the museum is looking for. So the Beeple example is a nice transition. Certainly, at least from the market perspective, we started paying attention because of that extreme price that was achieved. And we've touched a little bit on digital meets physical. And I think this example is a good one to think about if how do you engage your existing audience and how do you engage a digital audience, right? So physical meets digital. And this second work uh, by Beeple, Human One, which is, there is a physical element as well as obviously the digital element. Do you all think that that's the future? Do you think that's the only way to engage and enhance the traditional art world appeal? And what would build further credibility and understanding? Does it have to have this hybrid model or do you think it's really just gonna take some time? Um, personally, I. Uh... Particle is bridging that gap between the physical and the digital. So I do believe that that is one future for NFT, one that I'm passionate about, but there are loads of different generative NFTs. Um, the tangible aspect of you know, physical artwork um, is easier, I think, for the traditional art world to understand because that's what they know. Um, so it's maybe a, a sort of step in, but I don't see it as the only thing, right? I see it as one of the many ways NFTs can be utilized. So here's the, the Particle Foundation. To, to, to speak a little bit about what Particle does is we leverage blockchain technology to invigorate people to get, you know, have the full experience of the art world and getting people in the crypto space wanting to collect art. Because I think the, ult I mean, the ultimate experience of the art world is, um, you know, a sense of ownership or feeling a part of something. And so what we do at Particle is we, uh, technically speaking, um, we divide physical paintings into plots, which we call NFTs. So in this instance, it's the Banksy's Love is in the Air into 10,000 tiny little fragments, each um, represent a unique part of the painting um, as a digital representation uh, or reference. And what you get as a particle owner is a sense of ownership together um, of a specific painting, but also um, the feeling that you're part of a community of next generation collectors. So you're building the, the museum together. Um, and you have the full experience of the art world because you have, it, it, in a way, it can be um, compared to, for museum curators, uh, I feel like a lot of museum curators are here, so it would be the, the uh, equivalent of a patron's program, if you will. Um, and, um, and yeah, so that's, that's uh, the whole experience of the art world for the crypto space. And I think that, you know, we're trying to work with museums as well and galleries and, and artists directly. We started off with Banksy just because, you know, I know a lot of people are either love or hate Banksy, but just symbolically it made sense because of what he represents, art for the people, democratizing fine art, anyone can be a part of it. So... Uh, we started off with that and we are working directly with artists for the next paintings in order for them to also have, you know, royalties um, and expand their, their, their network of, of 
of people collecting their art, but also have direct engagement with these artists and speak to them directly and things like that. So we're looking at, you know, seeing how this could work also with museums if they wanted to particleize their work and have some sort of funding and have the people feel like they're more a part of the museum because they have that, you know, that association with that specific work in their museum. So we're working on it, but it's a, you know, it's a working progress and um, it's exciting because the possibilities are, are limitless. And Charlotte, I think you'll be making an announcement shortly about your next painting. Is that correct? So we should stay tuned in this yes, space. Yes, stay, stay tuned, stay tuned. And Jose, if you can engage or indulge the audience in the um, anecdote you shared during our prep, I love this oh, right. connectivity. <laughs> yeah, so um, purely by coincidence of me being on this panel, um, I, you know, once I realized I was here um, with the Particle team, I, I said, hey, I actually own one of these. <laughs> You know, I, I saw it and, and it fit my collector's thesis. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, it, for me, it's, it's for the same reasons that, that um, the other folks in the community that, that have purchased one and have held on to one. Um, I think there's a difference between uh, the mentality to flip NFTs for profit in some of the other collectibles projects, and then the desire to hold on to this piece long-term as a, an appreciator of artwork. So um, yeah, I'm excited for what's next. In thinking about collecting these, do you think that there's a credibility that still needs to come? Like Jose, what drew you to wanting to collect NFTs? It sounds like you have a thoughtful process on how you, do you see that parallel? Do you think that traditional collectors will consider this the next form of digital art? And I suppose a question for the audience um, a little later today, will museums, or do we still have work to be done prior to sort of accepting this into the art historical canon? So for me, I, I um, so I, I tend to, when I do buy NFTs, and I've never sold one actually, so I'm not the, I think I'm like a little bit different than most people. You know, if, if I were to have sold an NFT, I'm sure I'd be better off financially, but I buy what I like, and if, it, if the value goes to zero, that's fine. Um, and so I, I like art that has a good story. I like art that, um, like for example, here for Wocious, like this, this is an artist who um, I remember seeing in the space right, right at the beginning, right? For me, it's like before people, after people are the two kind of like uh, ways I differentiate the, the history of the crypto art scene. But um, I remember seeing them coming in early on and I was, you know, on Instagram looking to see, okay, who is this person? Uh, and this is a, a young artist who really was, like most artists today who, who are, uh, you know, around their age, um, was selling artwork online on Instagram, um, really communicating with their audience, live, direct, um, selling paintings, t-shirts, whatever they could, you know, throughout using these like web two based digital platforms that are made to order. Um, and then they, and then they were embraced by the crypto art community when their own family wouldn't even embrace them. And so there's this story here of, of, um, not just like success early on in, in an art career, uh, for a young person, but there, there's so many layers to it that make me want to, um, root for ferocious and be a collector. I actually don't own any of their pieces. I, I wish I did. Um, but that same idea goes for the, the types of works that I do collect when, when I think um, I have an opportunity to get in at a price that I can afford. On the other side of things, um, when it's not an artist from the traditional art world um, that's come in and, and that presents me with an opportunity to get exposure, I'm buying artwork on proof of stake blockchains um, where Primarily, like for example, on Tezos, there's a lot of artists from the global south who might not get this opportunity otherwise on any other platform because they're priced out uh, or because just they don't have the access. And there's so much great artwork there. Um, and it feels good to, to support artists whether or not that work is gonna increase in value just, just for the sake of collecting. Um, as far as the physical aspect of it, I, I think, People still do like 
having something physical. I know with, with the music industry, um, I was watching some um, musicians launch NFT projects. And if you go into the comments of, of uh, the Twitter posts, a lot of people, uh, their first question is, what is this? You know, and then the, the second question is, wait, are you, are you still doing physical merch? Because we still want to buy like the, the album or the t-shirt or whatever it is. And so I think, um, I think there's still a place for physical uh, for the, the average consumer or art appreciator. Yeah, people want to connect in, in real life too, especially after COVID. People need that sense of, you know, being around people, connecting on, on, a, on a real level. So I think um, that's why most of these projects, Board Apes, uh, crypto, all, the, all of them do, you know, in real life events where they can all meet together and speak about, you know, their which Board Ape they have. <laughs> and yeah. So how do you display? Oh, Nina, please go ahead. I'm just, I, I think it's so interesting actually having this conversation amidst curators from museums, because in fact, it is and will be your role to decide what your museum is going to collect or not. And, and here we are all are talking about different iterations of NFT art, but it doesn't have to be art. And I think, I think what's underlying all of this is, again, democratization, the transaction is a whole lot different and more transparent. I, I like your um, example of Fawocious, who is, you know, selling his work on Instagram. But once once he, he creates an NFT, there's a whole lot more flexibility. And again, the ability to be his own agent. So what the art is just to me is not less important, but a whole lot harder to put my finger on, you know, how to curate and really to decide what to collect and not to collect. I think what's super interesting and consistent among all of these conversations is the communities that build up around them, the facility to use that community, to really all of a sudden have a community that is that will never walk through your door. The, the opportunity with Particle to be part of a work of art and, and the opportunity for artists to be creating and participating in resale, but also just not, you know, not having to engage with an auction house, a gallery, an agent, and, and being sort of um, more flexible and more successful in getting their art out there. So that's what interests me in all of this. I wanna make sure we leave time for questions. So this will be my last question for the panel. If NFTs are here to stay, will the bubble burst? And if the bubble were to burst, is it because of a change in taste, a change in technology, or a change in the economics around them? I'm gonna to quickly touch on this um, because we already have seen, I mean, the, the, the volatility and speed with which the NFT market is moving is, you know, light speed. We really, as an auction house, and we only deal in secondary market work, right? We're not out there promoting new artists necessarily. In NFTs, we, we start to blur that space. We've already seen you know, this hyper um, uh, uh, gathering around NFTs to cool off a little bit. I'm just gonna go back to the point I made before. I think, I think the whole audience of art appreciators is going to decide what they wanna pay for an NFT, what's an interesting NFT, what's, what's uh, you know, you as curators, what, what is it worth my museum collecting? This market is here to stay because of the way that you can create and because of the way that you can buy art. So I think the market is only going to grow. I think really what will happen is that there's the potential for all transactions of all works of art to live on the blockchain and to have an NFT component to every single art that's created and every single art that you buy. So I think that the market itself only goes up. Remember the buyers of NFTs in the beginning, and this is still holds true to a certain extent, there's a real parallel between investing in cryptocurrency in the crypto markets and NFTs, one buoy the other. Essentially, NFTs sort of follow that craze. So watch the volatility in your crypto investments. It's the same in your NFT investments. I think it's, it's, it's hard to predict that. Yeah, and I think the value of NFT sort of got overshadowed by the volatility of it and how, how it went up so quickly. But there's ways of harnessing it where I think that the value will remain. And I think most of the projects who are in it to make a quick buck, I think those will, you know, disappear very quickly or that that's my view at least. 
And those that, you know, like Jose have a story behind what they're doing, something that's relatable, something that the community can really engage with and collaborate with the, you know, the creator that made the NFT or the museums that are presenting some sort of uh, way of engaging with NFTs that's more long-term. I think I see those staying. Um, ultimately, like I keep saying, the community is the one with the power and they're the ones that really drive the NFT. So if you can really build that community and engage with them, I think those are the, the projects that will strive. Uh, quickly for me, I, I think what I'd like to see happen and is, is for the projects that have the most um, social value kind of locked in. So like, like I said, a doing good, every NFT that's minted by an artist, they get to choose a nonprofit or social impact org that we've onboarded. And then this, the royalties get split Right? And, and the artist gets to choose a minimum of 5%. And then the collector or the artist, they, they all have a dashboard where they can see where that impact has been generated. And so if we can change the mentality from bragging about how much money has been you know, made from, the, from flipping an NFT to bragging about how much impact your collection has made and being able to verify that and track that and, and show that off, I think those could hold more value just because you can see that they've made some change in the world. Um, whereas all the derivative projects that are out there, um, you know, good luck, good luck to those. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> I'd love to turn to the audience, please, and hear um, either questions or how people are considering this technology at your institution. I think there are a couple of mics around too, if, if needed. recognition of this technology is really driving game game culture. And me and I share your expansive view on the deployment for physical art and art and just creating more liquidity and transaction velocity. Charlotte, I've watched the fascination of the particle community growing. And I just wanna I want to understand like just ask the question about, you know, on your homepage you talk about and you talk with this as a panel around like ownership and democratizing ownership and so on. You point, you point that out on the homepage. But on, in the fine print of that, you know, the page it illustrates that there's really no economic interest that the buyer gets from owning the particle. So I just wonder to understand how you reconcile those two and, and what people really are getting and whether they understand what they're really getting when they buy a particle. Sure. Good question. <laughs> um, I think with, with, with particle, when we say that we're, you know, there's no profit, we're talking about the physical work. So the physical work gets donated to the Particle Foundation, which essentially means that the value of the physical work is destroyed. And then in a way it will never be sold. So the Particle Foundation will never sell this work. Um, it sort of protects it. And then the NFTs are traded and you can do so as you like, hopefully you don't, and you're part of it you know, you're part of the journey with us and you keep buying these particles and building your collection. Um, that's the goal. Um, but um, what you get as a particle uh, holder is access to the art world. It's also um, a museum for the, the people that own the art. So they feel like they have a say in, ultimately we want them to have a say in, um, in, in you know the things what we acquire um, we have a voting system so they can the, just recently I asked them you know where would you like to see the Banksy next because we're touring it around the world rather than having these works of art that you know museums and private collections sometimes they don't have the space for it so it ends up in a storage space or in Delaware or you know at the Parc France so here it's really touring it so as many people can enjoy the art and feel really a part of it. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but the idea. It's an access, yeah, of really the, exactly. It's more, um, it's more of like the ultimate experience of the art world and what that means. And I think um, 
you know, getting access to museums, getting access to our expertise with, you know, different people in the ecosystem. Um, it's a way of having them interested in the art world in a way that they can understand also. Exactly. No, they don't. You're welcome. I think we had a question over here as well. Yes, please. And thank you. Since I have my mask on. Um, I'm Julie Walsh and I'm a digital art curator from Chicago and I'm very interested in a lot of the concepts that you've been raising and I have a couple of questions. Um, one is with all of the volatility in the market with NFTs, how do you suggest that museums think about acquiring artworks when they're publicly funded institutions and they have to deal with reporting to their board of directors and things like that, any sources of income? that might happen. That's question number one. Question number two is, are the particles F NFTs and why are there 10,000 copies of them? And uh, for Jose, I had a question about um, blockchain for social good. I'm super interested in other artistic projects that may be using blockchain and Web3. Maybe I can take the, the, first, the, the first part of your, your question. How can, NFT, how can museums acquire NFTs when the market is so nutty? I mean, I actually think that there's a huge opportunity for museums to be engaging with digital artists who are making NFTs and NFTs that haven't even gotten to the secondary market. Because we're, remember, we're the secondary market. Once they get to us, that there's a huge gathering around it and sometimes a big financial, um, financial footprint price. So really, we want to take our cues from you, really, really, in how are museums, because we, we, we want to filter at Sotheby's, and this is very deliberate, and take a little bit of a curatorial lens, um, or put a curatorial lens on the, the NFTs that we sell, and it, it puts us in the curator's position. We would much rather take our cues from you, see what you are collecting, and then reflect the ethos of our museum community. So I think as museums, you have an amazing opportunity to engage with, with living artists who are creating NFTs now to get in on the ground floor, to not wait until they come to the secondary market. Uh, in fact, I think Sotheby's would be, all of us would be thrilled to help you do that. And I think it's, it's actually achievable. To answer your question on why there are 10,000 NFTs, they're not 10,000 copies. Each particle or each NFT is a plot uh, which, is, which relates to a specific part of the painting. And why there are 10,000? We just pick 10,000 because that's normally how it's done with NFTs. Uh, it could be more, it could be less depending on the painting. Um, but it gives the opportunity for you know 10,000 people to feel like they're a part of it rather than the, I think the Uffizi was a one-off, right? That was, I think it was over $100,000. So I, I, it's, a, it's a completely different um, way of doing things. To answer your question about the uh, NFTs for social good. Um, so it's funny because last year, maybe around, around this time last year, um, there, when the like environmental topic was at its peak, there were some projects in the collectibles market actually, who started to incorporate um, donations, on-chain donations, uh, so you can verify that they've given it to you know the organization, um, into their their roadmap. So in in a lot of these projects, you know, as a way to attract people to invest in, in the collectible, they'll say, oh, okay, this is our projected roadmap for the project and why you want to get in early. And so a lot of these were starting to say, oh, okay, well, you know, we're a collectibles project and we're selling pictures of, um, I don't know, cats, you know? And so we're going to give, you know, if we make it to this part of the, the roadmap, we're going to give $20,000 to a cat shelter. Um, you know, I think that's a first good, you know, it's like a, a nice gesture but for me what what i really wanted to see even before i got into the environmental conversation was there's so much capital floating around how can you get a consistent re reoccurring um 
uh, stream of, of capital to places where it can make a difference. And so, again, these, these projects, you know, once they, once they launch version one, sometimes they'll do a version two, like the apes, and then, you know, they launch another add-on or derivative. And, and so there's so many chances to continue that funding uh, into arts programs or into, I mean, you name it, like there's so many things that, that could happen. Um, I think that the closest I've seen to the entire ecosystem coming together um, to try to do some good is uh, the Ukrainian relief effort. So that was a lot of different people that, that just came together and spun up, um, you know, curated art shows, if you will, of NFTs and, you know, raised so much money um, in such a short amount of time uh, to help during a crisis situation. Um, yeah, I, ho I hope that, that answers the question. Do we have time for, oh yes, please. Okay, um, <laughs> one question and directed towards Jose, when you're talking earlier, it was, I guess introduce myself. I'm, uh, my name's Ananda Siram. I'm head of arts and culture at the British consulate in New York. So not an art curator, but happy to be here. Um, and so just when you said that, you know, the environmental impacts of um, NFTs and how you have worked with people to offset um, what the impacts are, if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so so it's funny because I, I don't come from a climate background at all. I'm just a, an artist, a layman, if you will. Um, the reason why I got involved in that conversation is because I had some some friends of mine who were from the VR art community, um, you know, before crypto really really took crypto art really took off, and um, they were they were concerned, and I was more concerned with this narrative that a lot of people on the Ethereum blockchain who, you know, they have to defend their investments. Um, as they were educating this new wave of collectors and artists, they were telling people, you have to use Ethereum-based platforms. Otherwise, the work isn't valid and there's no value there. And in my head, there were so many, at the time, there's a handful of alternatives on other blockchains that are more efficient, more sustainable, cheaper um, to, to utilize, but no one was talking about them. And, and so I just didn't like that one-sided narrative. So that, that's prim primarily why I got involved. And then I started to learn about these different groups that were um, in, coming into the space from the, the offsetting community, the removal, carbon removal community. Um, and now there's actually this movement called ReFi, which is regenerative finance. And so it's, it's a lot, it's in the past six months, it's kind of sprung up. And it's a lot of um, folks who are looking at ways to address climate change through um, these same mechanisms that have been able to, you know, in, in for example, Constitution Dow, like raising 45, over 45 million to, opt to, to like try to win an auction for a copy of the Constitution. That's kind of just like a pretty wild idea, um, but it's such a simple thing to get on board with. And so I think for a lot of these projects that want to make some kind of change, whether it's climate or, or impact related. Um, I think if you can simplify that a little bit and turn it more into a meme and make it fun, um, I think that's the key to getting people involved um, at the ground floor and then supporting it like throughout the life of that campaign. I just wanna thank the panel today for all of your insights. I hope that allowed the audience to consider different aspects of NFTs and maybe bring a little bit more um, sort of holistic approach to ways in which your institution could utilize this technology. So thank you all so much.